Yes. Okay, if uh, he's not available, um, could we have Nina John pray for us, please? Let's pray. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. <laughs> OK. Gracious, loving Father, we come to your most holy presence in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness towards us, Lord, over the days and the week that has gone by, and for being with us, Lord, in every sense of the word with us, Master. Even as we begin our class today of Old Testament survey, we commit our uh, teacher, Pastor Deepika, into your hands and each one of us, Lord, that we would open our hearts and our ears, Lord, to listen to what you have to say, that it will make an impression on us and that we will be able to learn how you led people then and now and that you're the same God yesterday, today and forever. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, today uh, I never anticipated that all the things that happened this morning would happen. Uh, but then uh, one thing that I have learned is that in all circumstances, uh, however things may go, uh, the Lord is in control. Um, just a minute, please. I'm so sorry. This is like. I'm just so sorry for all the havoc today. Uh, yeah, the Lord is in control. The Lord takes care. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's rather a coincidence that, in fact, that's what we would see in Esther. Uh, it looks like everything goes uh, wrong for these people who are living in Persia at this particular time uh, in the book of Esther. But then even in all of those negative circumstances, which are, you know, kind of uh, unraveling, uh, the Lord works and he fulfills his purposes. So I, the central lesson that comes out of this book of Esther is that uh, the Lord is fully in control and his love and his sovereignty uh, take charge of all situations for us. You know, so it's basically two things, his love, his concern, the compassion that he has towards his people, that and the sovereignty of God, where um, uh, nothing is beyond his capacity. So we see these two things um, coming together to work out uh, the situation for these Jewish people, even as they are going through all of these negative circumstances. Um, so it's a narrative history, of course. Uh, so the genre of this book would be narrative history. And um, now people are not, the scholars are not very clear on who the author of this particular book is. Um, they say that um, it could be Mordecai because he does have a written record of some of the events. Uh, we see that in uh, Esther 9, 20 and 21. Uh, now that we're actually all together online, um, uh, if someone could please read out Esther chapter 9 verses 20 to 21. Mordecai record. Yeah, please go ahead. Mordecai recorded this event and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Zara. Zeres, yeah. <laughs> King Zeres King near and far. Zeres near and far. To have them celebrate annual the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar. OK, so very clearly it says here that Mordecai recorded these events. All right, so um, they say that 
uh, he probably might have been the author of this book because he anyway had he was already maintaining a written record of these events uh, now um, the pronunciation of this king's name uh, is not something that any of us is actually very clear on uh, it's a greek um, name you know a persian name uh, yeah i know I, I would not say greek it's more persian i suppose uh, but um, uh, the hebrew name actually is um, more familiar to us but then you know in, in some places the persian name is recorded so we generally just say king zeres is how it's generally pronounced so uh, key personalities of course you have esther who takes you know the central uh, role and um, you of course have the king you know uh, zeres or the hebrew name ahasuerus and of course haman who is the main villain of the story um, so coming to a uh, you know uh, the background of this book of esther uh, if you notice these Okay, I will begin and I hope that I'm audible. Uh, yeah, I was uh, talking about the background of uh, the... Um, I'm audible, right? I mean, you can uh, hear me. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much for responding. 
I, I'm feeling very tensed up. You know, if um, you know, if you dog, if you could all just you know continue praying in your heart that this connection stays, because I was not even supposed to be doing this from home. I was supposed to be at the Bible College teaching nicely, and uh, things just did not work out. So just please pray that the internet connection you know stabilizes at my end because it seems to be bad today. Uh, yes. So uh, let's just continue. Uh, so uh, the point that I was making is that the um, when the exiles were living in Babylon, they were given enough freedom to even move and resettle in other uh, regions. And so you have a lot of people moving to Persia. Um, and uh, so this, this bunch of people that we see over here in this story, these Jews are not even in Babylon. They are living in Persia, in different cities over there. And uh, the capital is Susa, where you have uh, King Ahasuerus, you know, establishing his throne. So um, they are all established right now in Persia. And in the in among these people who have moved to Persia, Nehemiah is one person who rose through the ranks and uh, became a uh, you know cupbearer. So um, uh, the Lord prospered them even though he had punished them by sending them away into exile. So it's a very important thing to note. Um, uh, he was angry with them and he did judge them and they lost their um, uh, dignity as an independent nation. Uh, they were no longer sovereign. But even when he took them into exile, his hand was still upon them. He still looked after them. So even when they began to disperse from Babylon into other regions, uh, he was there with them. And so we see Nehemiah rising to power in the Persian um, you know, kingdom. And uh, Mordecai also appears to have been someone you know, learned and uh, uh, probably holding you know, a good position somewhere. So we see all of this uh, in the land of Persia. Now, um, we know a lot about this King Ahasuerus, mainly because uh, the uh, uh, Greek uh, historian, Herodotus, he writes a lot about this particular king. And he mentions a lot about the culture of that time. So which is why um, you know um, we cannot dismiss uh, the book of Esther as some kind of myth or a fairy tale. Uh, the things which are mentioned the cultural details which they are which are talked about uh, all of these those things tally with the things that we see in the book of esther so this actually is a book uh, which has a solid uh, historical backing um, you know and um, zerus this, uh, this king zerus or ahasuerus i mean however we call him uh, he had to deal with some very um, bad um, you know, uh, riots at the beginning of his rule, uh, especially Egypt and, uh, in fact, even the Babylonians. Yeah, they kind of rebel against him, and uh, he has to put down those, you know, those riots, those insurrections. He has to put it down, and so um, he is a little touchy about any rebellions in his kingdom, which is why later when Haman, you know, he says, oh, these people, they have their own, uh, these Jewish people, they have their own customs. Uh, they may not really be obedient uh, to you. So there's a danger. It would be better if you wiped them out. When he puts these suggestions into uh, Ahasuerus' mind, um, Ahasuerus is more open towards that because already he's had two very major rebellions, you know, in his kingdom. And so he would have thought, OK, fine. I mean, what Haman is suggesting is a good idea. So um, that gives us an idea of, you know, of uh, Zerus' uh, mind frame at that particular point of time. Uh, one uh, interesting detail that comes out is that um, when he throws this uh, large, you know, feast uh, a, a celebration which lasts over many days uh, in fact many months uh, as he's doing that celebration we know right we are familiar with the details he asks uh, uh, queen vashti you know, to come and present herself in front of all of them and uh, she refuses uh, so after that uh, he dismisses her he no longer wants her to be uh, the the prime uh, chief queen uh, so he removes her from that uh, position and um, it is basically after that that he goes to Greece because he wants to uh, fight a campaign over there. And uh, he's hoping to bring Greece under his control, which, which at the moment it is not. Uh, so we see this campaign taking place. And so when um, you know he says, um, when the order is given that uh, a, a new 
uh, queen should be found and then they do the search throughout the land and they're trying to bring in the best uh, uh, young ladies uh, you know to the royal palace for training and all of that uh, when all of that's going on uh, Zerus is in fact away on his Greek campaign okay so um, yeah Zerus is in fact away on his Greek campaign during that period of time and then when he returns back that is when he chooses Esther so uh, this uh, Greek campaign is something that happens in the middle of this uh, you know, uh, story. And um, uh, at that particular time, he is able to conquer Athens for a brief amount of time. Uh, so he does have success for some time, uh, but it doesn't last long because the Greeks are rather powerful and they're able to take back their territory. So after coming back, he's kind of defeated and uh, that is when he chooses his new chief queen and after that he kind of spends more time just you know um, um, expanding his capital and uh, it's like he's licking his wounds uh, things are not very good for him uh, uh, so actually the this uh, writings of herodotus threw a lot of light on this man and uh, what made him function the way he did uh, and uh, you know all of his different responses when we when we look at him more in the light of the things which are happening in the background we get a, a better picture of who he was and uh, you know how he was functioning coming to the uh, book of esther itself uh, the structure can be uh, chapters 1 and 2 you know where, where you basically have um, the you know, Esther being established as the new chief queen. Uh, then chapters three to four, uh, where um, um, you have Haman's plot, and um, uh, you know Mordecai hears of the plot and he asks Esther to help. Uh, then of course the last portion would be chapters five to ten, uh, where you have Esther, you know, speaking up on behalf of her people and they are rescued. Uh, so. Um, uh, from the first section, chapters one to two, um, maybe one verse that we could, you know, look at, uh, chapter two, verse seventeen, where it says the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him. Okay, so uh, here is a king who has come back in a bad mood. He's had a painful defeat, uh, um, and um, uh, now he's, you know, uh, looking for someone who will comfort him and distract his mind and God moves circumstances in such a way that of all the ladies who have been chosen uh, Esther finds favor it says she found favor and kindness with him he was willing to show compassion towards her he was willing to be you know show, show more grace and mercy towards her so we see the Lord acting in the background of this story uh, coming to chapters three to four, another significant verse that we could just you know pick on uh, that would be Esther four fourteen, um, you know, which is a very popular verse uh, uh, where Mordecai speaks up and he says, "If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, uh, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this." Um, so over here, uh, Mordecai has absolutely no doubts that the Lord will come through for them. He says that so clearly. He says, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place because God is for them. Okay, so he has no doubt about that. Now, Esther can choose whether she wants to be a part of God's plan and participate in it and have the privilege of, you know, being a part of it. Or she can choose, you know, just to uh, look after her own position. Uh, so it's not that the people are at risk. The Lord will take care. The Lord will make a way. But how he makes a way, that is Esther's choice. She can choose to be a part of something that beautiful that the Lord is doing, or she can choose not to. Uh, so, uh, so we need to see that, you know, um, um, see the story even in the light of our uh, church today. Uh, the Lord knows how to take care of his church. Uh, the kingdom of God will prevail. Uh, there will be victory. Uh, because I mean, the Lord who knows the beginning from uh, you know the, the the end from the beginning, he he knows how he is going to work all things out. But then we who are playing our little little individual roles, we can choose either to be part of this grand plan and fulfill it, 
or we can be those who are you know just very um, narrow minded and say oh no i just think i'll just watch out for my own interests and not participate uh, so here uh, esther makes her choice and she says even if i perish you know if i perish i perish it's all right because i do want to be a part of this i do want to be a part of what god is uh, doing so she makes her uh, choice and um, then of course we see how god brings circumstances together uh, you know to uh, redeem uh, his people and uh, so it's generally pointed out in this um, you know book of esther that uh, the name of god is not mentioned even once even once you do not have the uh, you know the word god or the word uh, yahweh mentioned anywhere in this book uh, but at the same time um, you know uh, this king ahasuerus he's referred to they say 190 times maybe not by name but you know even indirectly he him his you know in that sense 190 times he is referred to uh, uh, so it's as if you know deliberately god uh, shows how uh, ahasuerus and haman are so much at work so much out there in the front trying to do things and god whose name is not even mentioned is controlling them is uh, orchestrating events so that his purposes will be accomplished rather than their purposes being accomplished. So we see that um, even when God seems to be silent and God seems to be absent, uh, he is at work in the, in the actions and uh, choices of these prime characters, the key characters who are you know, acting out all of these events. Uh, he, even though he seems to be completely absent from the scene, he is in charge of those people as well. And you know, this gives hope to the church, especially the believers who are in places where there's a lot of opposition and uh, where um, uh, they feel as if they are weak and helpless. Uh, this is something to remember. Even if God seems to be so completely absent that his name is not being mentioned, he is the one who is in charge of those prime key players. They are not the ones in charge. He is the one in charge. And he uh, manipulates events, orchestrates events to accomplish his purposes. Uh, and so at the end of the book, it talks about how uh, how uh, what God has done for his people. Uh, that is going to be celebrated uh, from then on through the Feast of Purim. Uh, that's the uh, term that is used over there. And it is called the Feast of Purim uh, because of the lots which were used. And that actually is mentioned in Esther chapter 3, verse 7. If someone could just please read out Esther 3, 7. Is anyone there? My connection is intact, right? It is. Okay. In the, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, that is a lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Okay, so they cast lots and those lots are called uh, pur, you know, like maybe paper chits or something where they would have written down different days. And then uh, they, they hope that the gods will decide for them which day they should choose. And uh, so they, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the evil forces which are behind this decision of Haman, uh, they chose this particular day uh, to do evil to the people of God. On the other hand, God chooses this particular day uh, as a great day of deliverance where they are able to you know, raise arms against their enemies and they're able to destroy because you know the command is finally given, right? That they can defend themselves, uh, that they can take up arms and weapons and fight uh, and defend themselves. So that day, uh, well, the lots were cast, you know, because in those days it was believed that when you cast those paper chits or when you shake them together in a bowl and then, you know, one uh, falls out, they believe that the gods, their pagan gods are 
choosing that particular date or particular name, whatever is written over there on that chit. So the evil forces chose that specific date for a very destructive purpose. On the other hand, God chooses that day uh, to become a day of great redemption, uh, a, a day when you know the people are, are saved. So um, again, we see uh, that they name this particular feast as Purim because they, for them, they will always remember that the Pur, the lot which was cast, it was cast for a negative purpose, but God used that Pur, that same date, that same lot to bring out something very, uh, you know, wonderful for His people. Uh, so uh, the Feast of Purim is one a new festival which is added, you know, beyond the festivals and feasts which the Law of Moses had in the in the beginning had uh, had instituted. So this is a new additional feast which is now added. And then later on, when we look into our uh, Jewish history, we see that this one more feast which uh, is also added later. Uh, that would be, uh, you know, in John chapter ten, verse twenty two where it talks about the Feast of Dedication, that actually is your Feast of Hanukkah. So later on, that also is a new feast which is added uh, to the Jewish community. And that, of course, was because you know um, of something which had happened when uh, during the Maccabean time when Antiochus had um, you know uh, come and desecrated the temple and he had uh, persecuted the Jews. Uh, so finally, after he's defeated, then the temple is re-cleansed and rededicated. And that was the temple of Hanukkah, which is actually mentioned as the Feast of Dedication in John 10, 22. So these are the two new feasts which get added to the uh, Jewish community. And both of them celebrate uh, the faithfulness of God, uh, the deliverance of God. Now, coming to the just some of the main features in this book of Esther, uh, you know, uh, everyone talks about, I mean, at least we uh, in India, we talk about how India gets mentioned in uh, the book of Esther, uh, which would be, you know, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse one. Uh, but I mean, if you look at it uh, geographically, um, the the portion of land that it is talking about, uh, that would actually be your Indus uh, River Valley region. You know, those of us from an Indian background who have studied Indian history, we've been taught about the you know Indus Valley uh, uh, civilization, right? Uh, so that was the region uh, which is actually um, located around northwestern Pakistan. So uh, this Persian Empire it extended up to northwestern Pakistan. That was the outer border on this side, on the eastern side, and then it also extended on the other side all the way up to uh, Egypt. To the area of Kush. Okay, so uh, technically speaking, it, uh, this is not India which is mentioned here, but rather Pakistan. Okay, so um, and uh, another thing um, in verse six, it talks about how you know uh, the uh, all these people are seated in uh, couches of gold and silver. Now, this is not just couches uh, which are coated with gold. No, these are like actually literal solid gold uh, so that shows the wealth of this king he was uh, so uh, yeah he was so um, i'm not particularly sure uh, what the uh, you know the question is the reference i hope you got the reference uh, that you know that you wanted if not you know you can just um, ask and then i can tell you which reference you wanted Oh yeah, moving on. Uh, so the, the couches which are mentioned in uh, verse six, those are actually solid couches of gold and silver. Uh, why? Because Herodotus mentions that when um, uh, for a for a temporary period of time, for a few months, when um, uh, you know the Ahasuerus is able to take over uh, Athens, he brings along some of those couches, and when they are driven out of the city. Uh, you know, they leave behind all of these gold, solid gold and silver couches, and that's recorded in uh, the writings of Herodotus. Um, and then in verse seven, there is a, a reference to the uh, wine which was served in unlimited supply to all of the people. Uh, well, this um, uh, wine was considered special because in the Persian kingdom, uh, you know, uh, the the vineyards were not really very plentiful. 
so wine was something that was um, expensive it was not easily available uh, so usually it's only the rich people who had grape wine uh, the rest of the people they they made their liquor using dates and you know other uh, other plants so uh, it's only the really rich people who could afford grape wine and uh, here we see you know ahasuerus supplying it unlimitedly uh, to show off how great he is and to show off how big his um, you know his wealth and his kingdom is um, now um, maybe one main thing that we could talk about is uh, you know mordecai who refused to bow down to haman because the whole uh, crisis started with this if mordecai had just bowed down to haman uh, none of the problems which came along would have happened you know so it is because of this person mordecai who refuses to bow down to haman that the whole series of events is set off and uh, so this is this is a question which i always had in my mind i thought i mean what is it and then uh, there are all kinds of um, i don't know uh, assumptions and myths which are presented regarding why he refused to bow down uh, but i think the simplest explanation uh, would be um, because of his background because of who he is um, oh, one thing that some people say is that he did not bow down because he should bow down only before god and uh, so he did not want to bow down in front of a human but then bowing down was just considered part of the you know um, eastern culture it was just considered a form of respect uh, it need not mean that you're worshiping that person uh, because even the israelites did bow down on on a whole bunch of occasions we'll just look at one example uh, genesis chapter 33 verse 3 if someone could read out for us please genesis 33 3 Because look at the amount of bowing which happens in this verse. Genesis 33, verse 3, if someone could read out, please. He crossed over before them, or he to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Okay, so seven times he bows down, even as he, uh, Jacob is approaching his brother Esau, he's scared and he wants to show him that, uh, you know, he's uh, very much respecting his brother. So he bows down before him seven times as he approaches him. So bowing down before someone was not something um, um, that would be considered of spiritual uh, nature. Uh, it is just a mark of respect. And uh, so that is not the reason why Mordecai refuses to bow down before Haman, the most likely reason may be uh, due to his uh, background. So exactly what is his background? Uh, Esther chapter 2 verse 5. Okay, I would be asking you to read a series of verses. Please, if you could do that, you know, I mean, whoever, whichever person chooses to volunteer. Esther chapter 2 verse 5, if someone could read out. There is there in Susa lived a Jew named Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimai. When King, okay. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so look at that. It says that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, that he was the son of Jair, the son of Shimai, the son of Kish. Okay, keep these names in mind. Now let's go to First Samuel chapter nine, verses one and two. If someone could read out 1 Samuel 9, 1 and 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Ibil, the son of Jerah, yeah. the son of... Yeah. Just move on to Bakarot. verse 2. Verse 2. And he had choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. Yeah, okay, so... There was not a more yeah, handsome Yeah, thank you. Person. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, the point that I was making is that Kish, okay, was a Benjamite and he had a son named Saul. So Kish is the uh, ancestor who is being referred to over here in Esther chapter 
2 verse 5, where it says, you know, uh, Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimai, the son of Kish. Uh, it doesn't mean that literally that, you know, the uh, the grandfather or the great grandfather was Kish. It just means that he's a descendant from this lineage of Saul. So Saul's dad was Kish. And from that lineage, Mordecai has been born. So he's a Benjamite from the direct lineage of Saul. And um, then when we come to um, 2 Samuel 16, verse 5, if someone could read out. 2 Samuel 16, verse 5. Go ahead, please. Second Samuel sixteen verse five. As King David approached Bahurim, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimai, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. Okay, so here the ancestors of Mordecai are being mentioned, and these are familiar names. Uh, Shimei is mentioned, Kish is mentioned. So um, this is the lineage of Mordecai. And we know the, uh, the severe antagonism that existed between uh, the people of Saul and the uh, Amalekites. Because when the Lord says, you know, uh, you uh, destroy all the Amalekites, Saul refuses to do that. Because of that, the tribe of Benjamin, in fact, loses the kingship. Otherwise, you know, the, um, the God said that he would, you know, allow them to be, a, uh, you know, that he would continue to allow their descendants to be on the throne. But then they lose that because of Saul's act of disobedience, where uh, the Amalekites are involved. And when we look at that particular passage, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 to 9, where Saul refuses to obey the Lord and you know, kill all the Amalekites. In verse 8, 1 Samuel 15, verse 8, it says, he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Okay, so um, there it talks about how the king of the Amalekites was Agag. And now we get to know here in the book of Esther that Haman was an Agagite. So he is from this lineage of Agag. And uh, Mordecai is from the lineage of Saul. And for generations, there was this strong um, ethnic hatred that existed between these two races. So there is no comment over here in the book of Esther. We do not know whether um, Mordecai was justified in holding on to this hatred, uh, which, you know, which had been passed down from generation to generation, whether or not he was justified but most probably he refuses to bow down because of who he is. Because when we look in Esther chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, it says there, then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? You know, the king has said that everyone should bow down before Haman. So why are you refusing to do that? Uh, um, so it says in verse 4, you know, uh, chapter 3, verse 4, day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated for why why are they so curious and why are they so interested and why do they pass on the information to Haman? For he had told them that he was a Jew. They were all aware of this, you know, ethnic rivalry that's going on between these two lineages. And and so they they pass on the information to Haman to, uh, to find out whether Haman will tolerate this or not. And uh, that is one reason why when, when Haman decides to kill all the Jews, you know, rather than just this one particular Jew who is you know, irritating and upsetting him. Uh, why? Because this is hatred which exists. So um, I am not sure at all whether in the Lord's eyes, Mordecai's behavior was justified or not. Uh, but uh, in the end, in spite of this man's you know, behavior, the Lord does save the people. He doesn't allow all the Jews over there in that land to be wiped out uh, just because of uh, you know, Mordecai's conduct. Uh, so um, I'm not too sure of the details, but this is what, you know, has uh, happens over here. Um, 
can we see that kish can be a great great yeah you know i would say great 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 uh, under a lot of greats because uh, uh, kish is where it starts off from kish you have saul and then from saul uh, you have um, uh, the of course the, the sons get killed um, you have one mephibosheth who survives but then there were other sons also so their lineages would have continued shimei it says very clearly was one belonging to the direct family of saul so the lineage in some way comes down all the way down to mordecai so very much he was very very much from the lineage of uh, um, of kish yeah if not saul at least from kish directly from kish his lineage can be drawn and uh, so haman he decides to take out his hatred not just on this one man mordecai but on the entire race when he gets a chance uh, but of course you know the lord does not allow this to uh, prevail to happen um maybe we could look at another little thing before we conclude um it uh, seems a little ridiculous that you know in those days there was a king and then he would just hold out his staff and only if he holds out his staff then uh, somebody can approach him it sounds a bit like a fairy tale but when we look at the writings of herodotus uh, we see that actually this was true uh, because he talks about the persian culture and the way the king conducted himself so it in fact is true uh that uh, herodotus writes that only the seven noble families you know the top aristocrats the seven noble families were allowed to enter the king's presence whenever they wished to nobody else was allowed except you know uh, with permission so the, generally the person who would give the permission would be someone called the chiliarch that would be the commander of 1000 a very high position in the army so that person alone can grant permission to any extra people who want to come and approach the king uh, so over here we see that um, there's a likely chance that haman is the one who was occupying this position so technically if someone other than the seven noble families wants to come before the king without you know having prior uh, in, in notified him beforehand then they would have to at least get permission from the chiliarch who probably was haman so esther would literally have to go to him and say you know look i want to talk to the king and then she cannot do that because after all haman is the one uh, whose plot she is trying to defeat so she could not go through the chiliarch and gain permission she literally had to take a risk and you know turn up over there without permission of any kind and uh, which is why she is very hesitant in the beginning and um, in fact another thing which she says she says for 30 days the king has not even asked for me which means you know at the moment is kind of lost a little interest in her so he her position is rather unstable at this moment uh, so uh, he has not been asking for her at all and moreover she is now going to go over there without uh, the permission of the um, ob obtaining the permission of the chiliarch okay so uh, all of these factors uh, actually point out that her life was genuinely at risk and then she finally says okay if i perish i perish and uh, even as i was you know just meditating upon this book the thought that came to my mind uh, is that many of us you know in the kingdom of god we've been placed in positions of influence in positions of honor uh, in places where you know we are in fact earning a lot um, but when we are called into those positions god expects us to use even that for his kingdom just like esther she had been placed in that very comfortable position where she had just been in exile before but now you know she's somebody in the royal family with all the comforts of life uh, god put her in that position but he was watching to see will she use that for his purposes will she use it for his glory and i think the same expectation uh, is there even upon us today uh, the lord looks and sees uh, you know uh, even as he has placed us in those positions uh, so um, it's not just for comfort and luxury that we are given these things i think there is also a greater eternal purpose for which we have been you know placed in these positions so whether you are in full time ministry or whether you know you are in the secular field in uh, whatever rank that you are occupying in society uh, it's not just uh, for your comfort alone i think there's also a greater eternal purpose for which you have been placed over there so there would be people that you will be able to influence there are things that you can do and achieve for the kingdom of god 
and all god is looking for is a you know a heart that wants to serve just like we saw in the story of nehemiah yeah so just this is just the things that i could you know kind of rush through um yeah um yeah sean you know he's like very particular about timing and uh, so yes he's saying that the bell has rung over there for them um all right so uh, let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for today's class uh, we thank you lord for uh, some of the things that we could learn from this book uh, the choices which um, they made oh lord uh, as people back then Uh, a choice which Mordecai made led to a lot of uh, strife and confusion. A choice where that Esther made uh, turned things around amazingly. So a lot actually rests on our choices, O oh Lord. So I pray, O oh Lord, that day to day, even as we make our choices, uh, we would do it in a godly manner, in a manner that uh, where we first consult you and seek your guidance. And um, uh, we would take the effort, O oh Lord, to hear from you before we uh, make our choices. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you are always with us to guide us and lead us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for uh, participating in the class. And uh, yeah, next time onwards, I'm, I'm promising you the class will go better. Thank you. <laughs>